Um, so my name is Chris Hammond. I'm one of the nurses with Jefferson County Public Health, um, and I'm doing this presentation on um, overdose prevention and response, kind of primarily that Narcan piece, how to use it. Um, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of information relatively quickly, especially if you haven't heard it before. So I'm going to try and go through it kind of fast, but leave a bunch of time at the end of qu for questions. So this will not take, my part does not take the whole entire hour, just so that you're aware. So, um, and thank you all again for coming to our whole event today. This has been awesome and um, incredible turnout that we've had. So a couple quick disclosures um, that we're going to go through. We're going to talk about what is an overdose, factors that increase the potential for somebody to overdose, prevention strategies, and then recognition and response strategies. The recognition and response strategies really are going to be more specific to stimulants and then even more specific to opioids. You can absolutely overdose on lots of other substances, but those are the two that we're going to focus on today, and then specifically Narcan. So some of those um, disclosures I was going to tell you about. So I do not have any financial disclosures. I am not being paid by the pharmaceutical companies to push Narcan or Naloxone. It just happens to be that that medication is what works really well to um, reverse an opioid overdose. A little bit of information about what this presentation is. It really is just based on that fundamental knowledge. We know drug use exists. Because we know that drug use exists, we know that that puts people at potential for overdose. How do we prevent overdoses from happening in the first place? And then how do we recognize and respond to, again, stimulant or opioid overdoses? So this presentation is really not focused on why people use, the challenges people face when trying to decrease or stop their use, stigma, anything like that. It's really just that basic overdose information. How do we prevent and respond to those? And one more um, quick kind of down and dirty reminder. Um, in medical care, in healthcare, we have to have multiple names for everything. So you may hear me talk about naloxone and Narcan, it's the same thing. One of the um, makers of the nasal spray actually trademarked the term Narcan, but for the most part, most people know when you're talking about Narcan and naloxone, it's the same thing. And it's, since we have a smaller group, if you have questions along the way, feel free to stop. Um, so what is an overdose, just in general? It's when you take more of a substance in than what your body can process. And that can be all sorts of different substances can cause an overdose. It's just your body can't process it all, can't break it all down as fast as needed. Um, the body response depends on the substance taken. So like when we talk about opioids and depressants, everything slows down, whereas you talk about stimulants, everything speeds up. So it just totally depends on what that substance is. Overdose can happen regardless of how that substance is taken. So whether you are swallowing a pill or maybe you're smoking a substance or snorting it or injecting it, some folks will think, oh, well, I'm not injecting it, so I'm just going to smoke this. I can't, I can't overdose. You absolutely can, depending on the purity, the quality of the product, how much you're taking, and how much your body can, can deal with. So some factors that um, potentially put somebody at a higher potential or increase that risk of somebody experiencing an overdose. These are not in any particular order. It is not that one is more important than the other. I just had to put them in and order somehow. Um, so the first one is change in tolerance or lack of tolerance. What we're talking about here when we talk about change in tolerance is if you have somebody who's been using a certain substance for a while and for whatever reason they decide to decrease or maybe stop that use, they stop using, their tolerance goes down. So then if they go to use again, their tolerance is lower, they're at much higher risk of an overdose. The flip side of that is a lack of tolerance. If you have somebody that's using a substance that maybe they've never used before, then they can overdose on it, especially if they're getting a high amount of it. Or maybe they're using a substance that, um, I pick a lot on street drugs, they're using a stimulant that they don't know has fentanyl cut into it, which is an opioid. They don't know they're getting that opioid, they're not trying to use it, they don't have any tolerance to it, they can overdose. Um, change in the quality of a substance, again, also I pick on fentanyl a lot, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but fentanyl is a really strong opioid it's getting mixed into lots of different things. So when we talk about quality, you're talking about, um, you mentioned earlier heroin in the state of Colorado. Heroin is anywhere between five to 30% pure. If you're used to using this 5% pure over here and all of a sudden you get the 30%, that can put you at a risk for overdose. It's a stronger amount. Or if you've got fentanyl being mixed in, again, you don't know that it's necessarily there, you're not trying to go out and get it, that can absolutely put you at risk for an overdose. Mixing, I mean, I should have put in here, this is mixing drugs, especially when we're talking about mixing opioids, benzodiazepines like Xanax and alcohol. Any of those in any combination, all of those kind of function to slow everything down in your body. And they work different ways, but you combine them all together, they can absolutely contribute to an overdose. Um, using alone, a lot of folks, 
maybe don't want to tell other people that they're using, maybe nobody knows that they're using, maybe they're in a group full of people that are using, but they go to another room to like actually use and do their own thing. Somebody doesn't know to check on them and make sure they're okay. Doesn't necessarily put them at risk for overdose, but it puts them at risk for a fatal overdose if somebody doesn't know to respond and check on them and make sure that they're doing all right. Um, existing health issues, this can be any kind of chronic health issue from lung issue, heart issue, um, liver, kidney, anything that affects how your body normally processes substances. If your body is already struggling a little bit, then it just makes it that much harder for it to get through a certain substance, you can absolutely overdose. Something a lot of people don't think about with this one is um, memory issues. If somebody has a prescription for something, say you have somebody who has a cognitive delay or a memory issue, they have an injury, they go to the hospital, they get sent home with a pain medication, they know they're supposed to take it, I took it at four o'clock like I was supposed to, and then at five o'clock they're like, hey, I have that pain medication, I'm supposed to take that, they've forgotten that they've already taken it, they can absolutely, they've already taken it, they're increasing the amount in their system, they can absolutely experience an overdose that way. And then access, access is a big one that we talk about, um, having medications in your home, just out on the counter, anywhere somebody else who may be coming in can access them, or maybe you have them in your purse and you leave your purse, I'm horrible about this, you leave your purse sitting somewhere and somebody else can just come along and you've got a um, medication or something that's sitting out there, that can absolutely put somebody at risk for overdose if they can get to a medication that they maybe shouldn't. So, some prevention strategies, these are kind of based on um, those um, risk factors we were just talking about. So when we're talking about tolerance, quality, or existing health issues, big, big couple ones in there and ways to prevent an overdose from happening in the first place, you can use smaller amounts first. You can always take a little bit of a medication or a substance and if it's not enough, you can always add to it. If you take too much, it's really hard to take it away after the fact. So using smaller amounts first, talking to other people, especially when we're talking about um, drugs that people are getting and accessing on the street, there is no FDA regulation around anything about um, street drugs. So talking to other people, hey, what have you seen? You know, is this is this good stuff? Is this bad stuff? Are people overdosing faster? What's going on with it? And then when we're talking about some of those cognitive issues or memory issues, maybe working with somebody who's experiencing that with the medication reminder or those great little pill organizers so that, hey, I have my pills already set out. I Oh, I don't remember if I took them, but if I go and I see that, oh, my morning pills are already gone, I already took them. Hopefully that's the idea and they didn't leave them on the counter somewhere. Um, avoid using alone, if at all possible. This doesn't work for everybody, but if you can tell somebody, hey, even if it's a text message or a FaceTime, hey, I gotta go do something, can you call me back in 10 minutes? Make sure I'm okay, and if not, here's how to respond here. I want you to call somebody so that they can check on me. Don't lock doors. I work with people um, in our certain service program all the time, and people will tell me regularly, oh, I, I'm around a bunch of other people, but I go into the bathroom, or I go into the bedroom, and I kinda wanna do my thing on my own. That's a great, do that, let somebody know, and don't lock that door. Because if you are not responsive and somebody's trying to check on you, it's that much harder to get through that door and get to you if the door is locked. Or if it's a small room, like a bathroom, something like that, and if you have experienced an overdose and you've fallen down and you've leaned up against the door, that just increases that potential problem. Um, avoid mixing, we talk to people about this all the time. If at all possible, we were talking about those big three kind of our opioids, benzodiazepines like Xanax and alcohol. If you can, use your opioid first. Again, use a little bit of it. Give it some time to kick in to do what you want it to do. If it's not enough, then you can always add something later. But again, once you're taking all three, if you take one or two or a combination of these, you can't take any away if you've taken too much. Um, access, keeping medications secured, locked up in places where people who can't get them shouldn't. So think of lock boxes. Um, not leaving them on your kitchen counter or not leaving them maybe in your bathroom. Especially one thing that people don't think about very often is if you are trying to sell your house, and you are having an open house or you are having showings where people are in your house, you have no idea who they are. Really good idea to either remove those medications with you when you leave or keep them locked up so that folks can't be accessing them. Um, another thing people don't think about very often is pet medications. I have an awesome example of this. I have a family member who had a very large breed dog who was on huge quantities of opioids towards the end of his life. He, they had a huge like Costco giant sized tub of opioids that was just sitting on their kitchen counter, which worked out okay and it was never an issue, but 
things to think about, making sure they're locked up, making sure if you're having situations, you're having parties, having people over your house, you're not sure who all is there, making sure those medications are not accessible. Not sharing medication. This is a big one. I know a lot of people will say, oh, I have this pain medication over here and my friend just had a little bit of an injury. Maybe it wasn't bad enough to go into the hospital, but they need some pain medication. Let me give them some. Bad idea. If this person over here who has that prescription has been on a chronic, has a chronic pain issue and has been on opioids for a long time, especially if it's a high enough dose, and then you go to give this person over here one of those high dose opioid pills, this person has no tolerance to that, absolutely they can overdose. So don't sharing them. And then properly disposing of unused medications. This is another favorite. People say, oh, hey, I got sent home from the hospital. I had an injury and I had a 30 day supply of medication, but I only used a couple days. I'm gonna hang on to it in case I need it again in the future. Don't do it, it just creates an access problem. You can always get medication again if you have another injury or problem but having that in your house, having it around potentially creates an access issue. And then working with syringe services programs, I have to throw this in there because this is my pet, this is where I work, um, but a, big, a couple of big benefits for syringe service programs are around overdose. We're working with people that are actively using drugs, actively injecting drugs, and we have this kind of a conversation with them. How do you recognize an overdose? How do you prevent it from happening? How do you use Narcan? And then we also get great information from the people that we're working with about the quality of the drugs that are out there on the street. So if somebody comes into me and says, hey, I don't know what's going on, but let everybody know there's something's in the mess right now and everybody's starting to overdose. I can get that information out then to the rest of the people that are coming in and it works as that network so we can help get information out and people can um, change their use accordingly. <coughs> so I pick on fentanyl a lot. I like to have this visual just because it's a kind of a good idea of um, why we pick on fentanyl. So this is um, a lethal dose of heroin compared to a lethal dose of fentanyl. Fentanyl is so much stronger than heroin. It just takes a little tiny bit. So if you haven't seen that before, this is why I put that in there. And that's why I pick on um, fentanyl. Little bit of legislation um, information kind of sprinkled throughout this presentation. Um, a quick little side note, all of these say harm reduction legislation. If you haven't heard the term harm reduction, you can think of anything that reduces the potential harm of something that somebody's already doing. So in the last several years, that has come to be sort of synonymous with syringe service programs and working with people who use drugs in order to decrease the potential harms of that use. So just a little side note, because you'll see that in here a couple times. In the state of Colorado, we have the 911 Good Samaritan Law. This law says, if I am with somebody who is experiencing an overdose, if I call 911, I stay with the person and I cooperate with whoever shows up, whether it's law enforcement, paramedics, whoever it is, I and the person who is overdosing are exempt from minor drug charges. This whole law came out because people were overdosing and dying because nobody wanted to call because nobody wanted to get in trouble. So that's the point of this one right here. Also so that hopefully you're not wasting time trying to move somebody and like drop them off outside the ER or something like that. You just call and get that emergency medical response to you. So a little bit, and this is going to be really, really brief about stimulants, just a little heads up warning. Stimulants increase everything. You think of all of your body systems, stimulants increase them. So increased energy, alertness, blood pressure, heart rate, all that good stuff. The biggest one that I see is uh, methamphetamine and cocaine are the two big ones. This is not an all-inclusive list, but just some of the more common ones. So a little bit about what a stimulant overdose looks like. I tend to move around when I talk. I'm kind of antsy. Somebody who is experiencing a stimulant overdose will be really agitated and moving around a lot and can't stop moving. Um, they may be kind of hostile. They might be sweating. They might say that they're having chest pain. They might be dizzy, confused. All of this is because they are, because of that increased stimulant, they're literally taking in a lot of information at once. All of their body, presses, body processes are heightened and they can't slow them down. So, um, stimulant overdose can absolutely lead to a medical emergency. You don't hear about it as often as opioid overdoses, but it does happen. It is a medical issue. I always default to call 911. Um, it can lead to a heart attack or stroke. When I was talking about somebody's moving around, they're really antsy, they're agitated, they can't stop moving. Telling that person or asking that person, hey, I just need you to chill out. I just need you to come over, I just need to chill out and take a minute. It is almost physically impossible for that person to do that. So that's not a very realistic expectation. Um, if you can get the person 
the stimulant stimulus around that person if you can either remove them from that situation or decrease the amount of stimulus around them that will help so I talked to people about if you can get them somewhere that is quieter cooler and darker this does not mean it has to be totally silent pitch black and freezing cold but if you can get them somewhere if you're in a room with a whole bunch of people if you can decrease some of the lights turn some of them off turn music down, have some of the other people leave the room, or get that person out of that room to somewhere you can control that environment a little bit more. Folks that um, tend to use stimulants regularly are not so great about eating and drinking because they have all that energy all the time, they wanna get all this stuff done, and it, it just doesn't really occur to them as much. So if you can get somebody who is in this situation, if you can get them um, some food, not a five course meal that they need to sit down and eat, again, that doesn't work so well, but if you can get them some snacks, some nuts to kind of eat while they're walking around, half a sandwich, something they can hold in their hand and remind them to eat periodically, that's awesome. Um, also, if you can get them water, I say fluid, however, please don't ever give somebody who is experiencing a stimulant overdose any form of caffeine. No energy drinks, no Red Bull, no Mountain Dew, no coffee, anything like that. So juice, water, anything that doesn't have all those extra stimulants in it because then you're just going to increase that issue. Um, and again, if that's not, if some of these steps aren't working, you get that medical assistance, um, medical response going on. So here's where we start picking on opioids, and this is the bigger part of the presentation. Again, not an all-inclusive list. Um, the more common ones that I see tend to be um, heroin and again, fentanyl. People don't always know that they're getting the fentanyl though. So opioids block pain signals. And they, they slow everything down. Again, they're a depressant, so they may slow your breathing. When your breathing gets slow enough or it stops, that's what then in turn stops your heart, lowers your heart rate. That's what then turns into the overdose. That's why people experiencing an overdose, because they're not, they're not breathing and then their heart's not working. So how does it actually work? How does an opioid overdose work? In your, um, and Dr. Tripp talked about this a little bit earlier, in your brain you've got these awesome little receptors Opioids come and they stick to those receptors. They're very specific to that. They like that. And that's what starts that chain of slowing everything down that then slow, lowers your um, breathing and your heart rate. An overdose, an opioid overdose does not always happen immediately. You will, you know, we've all seen pictures of celebrities and then hear about they had a syringe sticking out of their arm when they died or when they overdosed. That generally tends to be fentanyl um, because it's so much stronger. So, but, and it does happen relatively quickly with fentanyl. However, heroin, um, any oxy, anything, any of the other opioids, somebody can take them and it may take a little while for them to overdose depending on how much they've taken. So it's not always right away. So naloxone, Narcan, how does it work? You have those same little receptors in your brain. For whatever reason, those little receptors like Narcan way more than they like the opioid. So the Narcan comes along, it kicks off that opioid and it sits on that receptor and it blocks it. So you're not actually doing anything to the opioids that are in your system. The, you're not destroying the heroin or anything like that. It's still there floating around. It's just those receptors are blocked so it can't latch on where it wants to. Um, naloxone only works on opioids and it is a temporary fix for that um, opioid overdose process. And we'll talk a little bit more specifically about that. So um, it is temporary. It is an opioid antagonist. It only works on opioids, so I think, I can't remember Butch, and I think somebody else referred to this earlier. You could give me Narcan right now and I would not know it. It does not do anything to anybody that does not have opioids in their system. So it's not going to harm somebody, but if you're not sure if somebody's experiencing an opioid overdose, because maybe they're just not responsive in general, you can absolutely give it to them. If they don't have any opioids, it's just not going to do anything, but it's not going to harm them to give it to them. Um, when we say temporary, it lasts about, the box will tell you, it lasts about 30 to 90 minutes. It's generally about an hour. Um, and we'll talk about what that looks like after that wears off. It is not addictive. There is no potential for abuse with it. There is no side effects. I have in parentheses, dose dependent. The formulation that you can get by going to the pharmacy, the one that you and I can all carry on the street, is what we like to refer to as the kinder, gentler version. This is a lower dose. Um, it's a little bit more mellow. It does not generally put somebody into immediate acute, oh my goodness, what did you just do to me withdrawal. It is, does kind of start that withdrawal process, but it's much slower and a little bit more mellow. And I say dose dependent when we're talking about somebody who is receiving Narcan or Naloxone when they go to the ER, that is a much higher dose. They get that dose IV 
and it's based on their body weight, so it's big, heavy, big, that one will put somebody into immediate withdrawal. So that's the difference there. So there is a, it isn't really a side effect of it, it's more like an effect of it, is it's reversing that overdose, which is what's putting somebody into withdrawal. So again, you can give it to anyone at any time. Sorry, go ahead. So then do the hospital start treating the withdrawal in most cases? That's a very good question. My hope and my assumption is yes, um, but it depends on, it depends on the hospital, it depends on the protocols. It also depends on um, how long you, somebody can leave um, against medical advice, so it also depends on how long that person stays. If they come out of it and they're like, nope, get me out of here, I'm not staying, then it wouldn't be treated. But ideally, there are a lot of um, pilot programs that they're trying to work on now about helping people, I think um, Jessica talked about it a little bit, helping people in the ER get into treatment or helping start that um, medication-assisted treatment process, getting that started in the ER so that, and that can help with some of the withdrawal, withdrawal process. Um, Naloxone Narcan is not a scheduled drug. We talked about a little bit earlier. It is available at any pharmacy that it carries it um, through those standing orders from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. You might have a copay. I had a little bit of a copay when I got mine um, through my insurance. Medicaid pays for it, they cover it. Um, we'll talk about the different formulations. There is one nasal spray formulation that Medicaid doesn't cover all of part of it. You have to pay for one of the pieces that goes with it. It's not actually the medication, but for the most part, um, insurance covers it. And the over-the-counter formulation that you and I can give, again, is not given an IV. You don't have to find somebody's vein. It is either the nasal spray, like what um, Dr. Valak talked about earlier, or it is an intramuscular injection, which kind of freaks some people out, but it's a straight shot into a big muscle. So you're not having to like find somebody's vein and do anything um, heavy-duty medically technical. So again, a little bit more information about the legislation in Colorado. We talked about this a little bit. The standing orders mean that um, the medical director of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has signed these orders saying any pharmacy can distribute Narcan. So if you go into a participating pharmacy and they say, oh, you need to go to your doctor and get a prescription, no, you don't. Some of the pharmacy techs, especially with employee turnover, staff turnover, things like that, don't necessarily know. Most of the pharmacists do. You can absolutely ask to talk to the pharmacist. But, or, and if you have any problems, you can always contact us. We like to know about these so that we can contact the pharmacies and let them know, no, no, this is not the case. You actually can give this. Um, the third party naloxone, that says that you and I on the street, if we give somebody naloxone or Narcan in good faith because we think we're trying to help reverse an overdose, then we are exempt or immune from criminal prosecution. Just so somebody can't come back and be like, this person gave me Narcan. I don't know why they would, but you never know. A um, couple quick myths that people hear about naloxone and Narcan. You might hear somebody say, oh, well, no, we shouldn't be giving Narcan to anybody. We shouldn't be handing it out to people because people have Narcan parties where they are intentionally going out and intentionally overdosing if they know that Narcan is available so that they can have like a near-death experience and then have that overdose reversed absolutely been debunked it is not a thing anybody who has ever been on the receiving end of narcan will tell you they do not want to repeat the experience it is not pleasant um, same kind of idea that drug use will increase if people know that narcan is available oh well, i'm going to use more than i normally would because i know that if i overdose i can reverse it again not the case people that have experienced narcan don't want to repeat that um, the other thing and i alluded to this a little bit earlier immediately move back after giving narcan you may hear this generally from people who work in the ER. Because they are giving that much higher dose and they're giving it in a vein, that huge dose does put somebody into immediate withdrawal and they can come to really fast and they can be really confused and they can sit up and like be mad and literally come up swinging. They can. However, the dose that you and I can give on the street is not that dose. This is a way more general, gentle dose. Um, you don't have to move back. Generally, the person, once they start to respond, it's a pretty slow response anyway, but it's not that immediate, oh my goodness, what did you just do to me? So, this is kind of the down and dirty of this presentation. How do you actually respond if there is an opioid overdose? Number one, you have to recognize what's going on. We'll talk a little bit about how you recognize that. Number two, you call 911. Get that emergency medical system going especially with fentanyl going around, even if you have your two doses in your kit. Um, lots of folks are telling us it's taking more than two doses to reverse an overdose. So you want to get more people there that can help you and that have more Narcan available. Um, so you recognize it, you call 911, 
We do two rescue breaths if you know how to do them. It's also very easy to learn. Ideally, you get somebody to the floor, you tilt their head back, you lift their chin, pinch their nose, breathe into their mouth twice. Do not try to rescue breathe for them for 10 minutes. This is just try to see if it does anything, see if they respond. Um, if they don't respond or they're not responding well, you go ahead and give them your Narcan or your Naloxone. Then you go back to your rescue breathing. If you've been trained on how to do CPR, you go into those regular chest compressions, rescue breathing, all those things that you would normally do. And you wait for two to three minutes. It is the longest two to three minutes you will ever experience if you are working with this. Give Narcan, you give it two to three minutes to um, start to activate and do its thing. And in those two to three minutes, you're still doing your CPR, you're still doing your rescue breathing, but you wait before you give a second dose. Um, I have a little asterisk on here. Fentanyl is problematic on so many levels. Fentanyl um, makes your chest wall really rigid. So if you are trying to do CPR or you're trying to give rescue breaths, anybody who's ever been taught how to do CPR, they drill into you. Make sure you're doing effective rescue breaths. You have to make sure that the chest wall rises. You may not see that if there's fentanyl involved. Also, those chest compressions may be harder to do because your chest wall is rigid. So you've waited two to three minutes. You're doing your extra CPR. You're doing your rescue breathing. You've gotten through that third minute. That's when you can consider giving that second dose of Narcan or Naloxone. If you have not, I work with a lot of people that say, nope, not calling 911, don't care, have had horrible experiences with law enforcement not doing it. If you get to this point where you're considering giving that second dose and you haven't called 911, call. Because again, it could be something else totally different going on. They could be having a medical emergency or they could potentially just need more Narcan than what you have available. So how do you recognize if somebody is experiencing an, op an opioid overdose? Number one that I tell people before anything else, are they responsive? People tell me all the time, they've turned blue, they've stopped breathing, they're not, their heart's not working. That is absolutely true. My hope and my ideal little public health nursing world is that you get to them before they've stopped breathing and before they're turning blue. So if somebody is non-responsive, you're kind of they're sitting next to you and you're like, hey, are you okay? Are you okay? Somebody who has a lot of um, opioid in their system but is still able to respond to you is not overdosing. Doesn't mean they're not going to, but if you ask them, are you all right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. For the most part, they can still respond. They can still respond appropriately. If they are not responsive, the other big one that I tell people, this is really easy to do. People like to do it as their friends to be mean. If you um, make your fist like this, rub right here with your knuckles on, this, on their sternum, it's called a sternal rub. It is not comfortable when you're doing it to somebody else. If they are not responding to that, that is a really good idea that something else is going on. Um, you also might see, again, I pick on the non-responsive because that's a really big, really easy one. You might see them in what's called like a heavy nod. They might look like they're sleeping, but you can't wake them up. They can't respond to you. Um, their breathing might be kind of slow. It might be erratic. You might have some weird gurgling noises, or they might not have any. Um, if you know how to check a pulse, again, it might be slow, it might be erratic. It's not a regular rhythmic thump, 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 if you're used to knowing how to check that. You might see changes in their skin color, or their skin might be kind of clammy. So when we talk about changes in skin color, you tend to see them in fingertips or lips first. So in lighter skinned folks, they turn purple, they turn blue in those places first. Darker skinned people tend to turn more ashen, so it's just a little bit of a different color change. They've got that pale face, everything like that. May have a limp body, they may possibly be vomiting. But again, the number one thing I tell people is if the person is not responsive, good idea that something else is going on. And again, it may not be an opioid issue. If it's somebody you don't know and you're coming across somebody, it may be a totally different issue, might be a different medical emergency. But the non-responsive one is the biggest one. Couple things on how not to respond. Couple of these are my favorites because I hear these from people all the time. If I just, I just smack my friends around all the time. You can do that to try to see if they're responsive, but please don't smack them around for 10 minutes. Same thing, you can shake them, that's fine, but again, don't shake them repeatedly for 10 or 15 minutes um, trying to see if they'll respond. Another big myth that's out there is cold water or ice will reverse an opioid overdose. Remember those receptors and you've got your opioid on there? Cold water and ice does not do anything for those. The other problem with this is if you are trying to, oh, I'm gonna get somebody in a cold shower. If I'm trying to move somebody from, say, a living room or a bedroom and I'm trying to move them into the bathroom and then get them up and over my tub and into the tub and I'm the only one there, especially if it's somebody that's bigger than me, I'm probably gonna do more physical damage to myself and to that person. <laughs> Pulling arms, anything like that, knocking into doorways, 
but also all you're doing is wasting time and that cold water doesn't do anything for an opioid overdose. So don't try to do it, <coughs> pardon me, don't move people. The other one I hear a lot is, oh, I gave my friend a stimulant to offset their opioid overdose. So I gave my friend a shot of methamphetamine because that'll get their heart going again. It may, remember stimulants increase everything, it may do that, it might increase that, but it's not doing anything for those opioids that are on that receptor and it doesn't actually do anything to offset that opioid overdose. So especially with the fentanyl going around, all of these things are just time wasters, that's all they are. And the, the faster you can get Narcan into somebody that has fentanyl in their system, the better. So, a little bit about packaging, I have a little bit more, I have examples of all of these here today if you wanna look at them. I lied a little bit, I don't have an example of the um, vials today. But there are two different forms of Narcan that come in as a nasal spray. There are two different forms that come as an injectable version. And we'll go through them relatively quickly. But so the nasal spray, absolutely positively, if you remember nothing else because the nasal spray is the one people like to use because it's the easiest, can you give this to somebody who is not breathing? Absolutely, yes, you can. The nasal spray is not inhaled into their lungs or anything like that. It's just absorbed in the mucous membranes in their nose. So a lot of people think, oh, no, I can't give this person's not breathing. No, 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 no. We wouldn't have it if that was the case, so go ahead and still give it. Um, the Narcan that has been trademarked, that is the one that Dr. Valak was using earlier. We have, that's the one that we have some of today. The little doses look like this. Again, you can look at these when you come up. Um, you take them out of the box that they come in. There's two doses in there. This one is pre-assembled. It's ready to go. You open it. You put it in the person's nostril. You depress the plunger. That's all you have to do. And then you go back to your rescue breathing and everything else. The, um, and that's the pink and white um, box at the top. That's the one that's a little bit more common because it's a little bit easier to use. The other one that's on here with the yellow kind of barrel and the long vial, I haven't seen this as much, but I've heard a couple people lately say that this is the one that they got, so that's why I incorporated it into this presentation. This is the original form of the nasal spray. It's a little bit more intensive because it has parts that have to be put together. So you've got this barrel thing, you've got to pull yellow, yellow ends off, then you have this long skinny vial of Narcan, you have to screw that into um, the barrel. You have to add this atomizer, which kind of looks like an upside down snow cone, and then you can give it, and that one still is a nasal spray, but you give half in one nostril and half in the other. Again, this one is a little bit more time intensive, it's a little bit more assembly required. If you go to the pharmacy and this is the one they have and this is the only one they have, totally fine, it still works the same, but I would become really familiar with it. Don't take the ends off the vials because then you're gonna make it um, not helpful and not useful, but um, get familiar with those parts so that you have an idea, you know what to do with them when the time comes that you have to use them. So then the injectable versions. Couple things about the injectable version. Either one, doesn't matter which. You um, absolutely, again, do not have to find a vein. These are intramuscular injections. So ideally, what I tell people is big muscle. I just tell everybody, just go for the legs. It's just easier, straight shot. Some people have smaller arms. If you um, are giving somebody an injectable, the injectable version, and you tend to and you hit a bone, it's gonna freak you out. It's not gonna freak first now, but it's gonna freak you out. So just go for a nice big, you can go right to the top of the thigh, or the side is totally fine. Um, I have a question mark along, may need to remove clothing. In general, you do not have to remove somebody's clothing to give them the injectable version. However, I say in general, if somebody's wearing kind of a normal amount of clothes at summertime, whatever, fine. If you are having somebody that has um, maybe nine layers of clothes on because it's winter and it's cold and they have all these layers and they're carrying everything that they own with them, so they're wearing everything that they have, in that case, then you may have to try to remove some of those layers of clothing. And again, in that case, then it might be easier to try to go for an arm, but I tell people just try to go for the leg when you can. So the first one is the one that I don't have the example of, and I apologize for that. It's a kit that has two little vials in it. Again, this is gonna be some assembly required, so I encourage you to get familiar with it if that's the version that you get. You have these two vials, you'll have two syringes. If you've never done anything with um, vials or anything before, play with it a little bit so you kind of have an idea. But this one, you're gonna open the syringe, pop the top off the vial, insert the syringe into the vial, turn it upside down. See, it's kind of long and convoluted, right? Draw up the um, medication into the syringe, pull off the vial, get rid of any air, and then you're ready to go. And again, straight into, straight 90 degree angle into a muscle. Yes? Will an air bubble really kill somebody? It has the potential to in a muscular injection. It's really low potential, but it's there. It's more um, in an IV. Yes, IV is a problem. 
It's a good question. Who's that? Um, <coughs> if you hear of anybody say anything about, oh, there is a shortage of Narcan, or oh, that Narcan is really super expensive, nobody can afford it anymore, for the most part, they're talking about this cute little yellow and purple guy that is called DSVO. This is actually, this is an auto injector. So everything you need to inject um, Narcan into somebody is in this little guy, and it talks you through the whole process, mm -hmm. which is why it is incredibly expensive and almost nobody carries it anymore. But we put it out there just in case. So this one has a little tab on the end. You pull the tab off, and then it starts talking to you, and it tells you what to do. The whole entire package goes against the person's muscle, and it'll talk you through it. You depress it, you hold it for five seconds, and then you take it away. So again, this one's a little bit easier because you don't have to mess around with stuff, but it's super expensive and you hardly ever see it anymore. Um, regardless of what formulation you get, there should be two doses in your kit. So whether it's the nasal spray, whether it's the um, auto injector that talks you through it, either way you should have two doses. The reason why there's two doses, ideally again in my little public health nursing world, is not one for me to hang on to and one for me to give to my friend for them to hang on to. Especially with the fentanyl, it is way better to have two doses if you can. So if you want to give your kit to somebody else, give them the whole kit and get yourself another one. Um, the flip side of that is, it is always better to have one dose than none, but it is way better to have two doses than to just have one. So, after you've given somebody Narcan, Dave, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Is there any legal ramifications to giving Narcan to other people? Nope, that's that, excuse me, third party naloxone law that says yeah. that nope, if you are giving it to somebody in good faith Not because you think you're. Not administering. Oh, you mean like um, handing it to somebody? Narcan, you no. Have it no, because same thing, um, and I think they alluded to and talked about it earlier. Like, if you go to get it, you can get it for somebody else. Like, I'm not getting it for me, I'm getting it for my family member, I'm getting it for my friend to hang on to. No, no, because anybody could go in and get it. So it's not, it's not on the same level as like sharing your own medication, but it's more of that, and especially because it doesn't do anything. There are no harmful side effects to it. Yeah, so your question. Um, so if you do, um, see somebody start to respond after you've given them Narcan. Awesome, great, wonderful. They're going to be kind of confused and they're not gonna feel very good. So tell them what happened, absolutely. Again, they're not gonna know what happened. Hey, I'm pretty sure you were overdosing. I gave you Narcan so that they know. Hopefully you still have medical care EMS on the way so that they can be evaluated. They can be watched for a little while. When we talk about that temporary, how long Narcan lasts, it's temporary. The boxes will tell you 30 to 90 minutes. It's about an hour-ish, um, depending on the person, depending on the dose, depending on what else is in their system. So if the person, um, say like we were talking about earlier, if they don't want medical care, they don't want to get transported, EMS goes away. Whatever reason, if they, you don't have that there, if you can stay with that person or somebody can stay with that person, keep an eye on them for an hour or so at least, hopefully maybe a little bit more, um, that is helpful to make sure that they don't overdose again when that Narcan wears off. So if you have enough, again, think of that Narcan coming and it's covering those receptors, it starts to wear off. It's not doing anything to the opioid that's in the system, it's just blocking the opioid's ability to do what it wants to do. So you could still have enough in your system where you could overdose again after the Narcan wears off. The flip side of that is, especially for folks that are using like um, street drugs, especially heroin, you give this to them, they get into a little bit of withdrawal, they don't feel good, they want to use again pretty quickly. Two problems with that. Number one is, you still have the Narcan in the system, it's not going to do them any good. They're just wasting their drugs, they're wasting their money. Second problem is, you've got, you already have a certain amount of opioid floating around, if you just add more to it, again, when that Narcan wears off, you have a much higher likelihood of overdosing again. Mm. So if you, if and when you get your kits, couple things about how to take care of them. Keep them out of light and avoid extremes in temperatures. Um, the, this nasal spray version and the um, auto injector that talks you through it, these containers are already protected from light, so that part's not an issue. But if you can keep them at room temperature, that is ideal. Don't put them in a refrigerator. Ideally, hopefully, don't leave them in a hot or cold car that's sitting out in the parking lot for eight hours. Um, I had another thought on that, I just went away. Um, this can be a problem for folks that are experiencing homelessness. 
with that, what I tell them is do the best you can. Try and keep it as protected as well as you can because I'd still rather you have it than not have it. Um, it just may not, if it does have a lot of damage to it because of heat or light, then it may um, just not work as well. But again, it's always better to have some than not to have any. And then checking the expiration date when you get it. Make sure you know when it expires so that with any luck, if you don't ever have to use it, you know when it expires, you can go get more. But expired Narcan, again, just like if it's been exposed to heat or light, doesn't work as well as non-expired Narcan. So just make sure you know when that's coming up. So you all have now been trained in how to do Narcan, which means that you all can now train other people in all of this. So if and when you are training folks, this might have been a little bit more in depth, but the big things that you need to cover are these. What, what puts somebody at a risk for overdose? How do you recognize that overdose? That are they responsive? Calling 911, doing those rescue breathings, and then actually giving the Narcan. I know I went through the how to give Narcan part pretty fast. You'll have instructions, you'll have all that stuff when you get your um, kit. Couple quick resources. Um, Dr. Valak talked about this one earlier. StopTheClockColorado.org. This um, website is maintained by one of our other syringe service programs in Denver. And they are awesome. There is actually, there's this nice little ribbon that says click to get in the lock zone today. You click on that, it will take you to a map. You can um, click on the map, make it bigger, make it smaller. You can also do a drop down and click what city you're in and the map will then go to that city and show you the pharmacies in your area that are carrying Narcan. Did everybody get that before I switch my slide over? Um, again, I'm so excited that Dr. Valak talked about this earlier because then I'm like, hey, look, I have it too. Um, the OB Rescue app, this is a free app. It does not currently have the resources for treatment on it, but it is going to, hopefully, like we said, um, in about October. Um, it has the information on that that we just talked about. How do you recognize an overdose? And then it's got this great thing where it says Start Rescue. If you're not sure, you can pull out your phone, hit that Start Rescue, and it will start walking you through the steps. Maybe it's been a year, you haven't been to a presentation for a while, you're like, hey, I know something about how to do this, but you need that refresher. You can absolutely use that. Um, couple things that we didn't touch on hugely, but again, syringe service programs are awesome ways to get help people get some additional information, get that overdose prevention education out there. The medication disposal. So we were talking about properly disposing of medications. In the state of Colorado, there is a great program that just started a couple years ago that where there are medication disposal boxes periodically here and there everywhere. You can take your medications at that time, get rid of them, take them to a proper disposal place. Also, twice a year nationally, the DEA has a National Drug Take Back Day, and um, Lakewood, multiple places in um, Jefferson County respond or participate in that. You can absolutely take your drugs that you want to get rid of to those take back events also to get rid of them. Again, keeping that, lowering that access, making sure that they're not um, available for folks. Um, again, if you could benefit, do you want me to go back? I totally can. <laughs> Um, we do have some Narcan kits available today. I'm not going to lie, I think I probably have enough to give everybody in this room one if you want one. Um, <laughs> she's like, yay! Hey, no right? so <laughs> <laughs> we do have to have you sign something just saying that yes, you've been trained and all that good stuff. Um, we got those. Um, there's no cost to them. Megan or myself will be able to help you with that. Really quick thing on references what questions do you guys have? I'm going to go to the monitor. 